Say, Watashi no unchi wa doko desu ka? Watashi wa unchi no doko desu ka? Watashi no unchi. Watashi wa unchi doku desu ka? Watashi no unchi ga doko desu ka? Watashi wa unchi ga. Watashi no. Watashi no unchi ga doko desu ka? Doku desu. Doku? Doko. Doko desu ka? Doko. What am I asking? Where's my poop? <laughs> <laughs> hey, welcome to the G Club. <laughs> Say we're going to talk about poop no, in video games. No, we're not going to talk about Did you ever make that horse poop game. in MGS5? Because I did. Yeah, it was like an ability you can unlock, right? Yeah. You, you can, can make them shit all command. over the floor. Doesn't that make people like trip? Yeah, it can make cars spin out. I think I tried to make a tank. Cause there's a there's a mission like five missions in or something where there's like three tanks that you have to blow up with a rocket launcher, mm -hmm. and I, and I would try to make the horse poop and then make the tank spin out, but I don't think that. Happened. I don't know if the tank spin out. <laughs> That'd be some heavy duty poo. Yeah, and some really though. shitty treads. That would be some Kojima shit though. It would be. Yeah. yeah. Which I'm very excited for. Or it whatever. doesn't make it slip out, but it just makes it stop, and then a guy hops out of the tank and, like, looks at it. You know, when I see all that trailer shit for uh, Death Stranding, and mm -hmm. how, like, fucking raw and serious and gritty it is. Does it look serious? I'm just like, yeah. It I mean, it's pretty silly to me. Well, it's like, I mean, the way it's presented is very straight. But, like, I, see. Yeah. I, I know when you load it up, it's just going to be like, oh, go over here and say hi to the baby. And the baby's going to be like, la, la, la. And then you can, like, he's a pour water on the baby. And then he's like, eh. <laughs> and it's like, oh, it's funny. Dude, I hope, I hope. <laughs> I don't know why baby abuse is, like, the first <laughs> thing I went to. Yeah, you just you just mess up babies. You mess up Guillermo del Toro's baby yeah. and he gets upset. Death this standing. is a really squeaky chair. Why do I have the squeakiest chair? Sorry, man. Fuck. My chair's not squeaky. I really hope that Death Stranding goes full uh, Dark Souls with it with its uh, NPCs, where you just have no idea what they're talking about, and then they show up dead later, and you're like, okay, cool. Oh yeah, and that's like an arc. Like, and I you guess have to, I like, fucked up somehow. And you have to go on Google and look up like what that is. It's like, oh, if you give the Ring of Undying to uh, Gwyneth, then yeah, that that prevents Altizior from completing his <laughs> quest. And you're like, I should have known that. Yeah, fuck me. Well, there was that. There's shit like that in Bloodborne too. Um, I never got that far in Bloodborne. Where it was like this, the the big quest, the main, or not the main quest, but the big side quest was with the Raven girl or guy. I don't even remember if it was a girl or a guy. It was, mm -hmm. it was like the crow or something, and then you would talk to P pickle that me pumperum. What pickle pea pumperum crow? Sure, and you would talk to pickle <laughs> pea, and that's the crow from Dark Souls. That's like ah pickle pea. No, no, that's not real crow. I'm oh. talking about there's a person who's dressed as a crow. Oh, okay. Or, or like has like a bones kind of like hospital whatever. But they're really good. They're really like strong, mm -hmm. and so you can go up to them and talk to them. But and you can fight them, and then you win and you win a, sh a thing. But um, if you just talk to them, and then they show up at like really specific locations throughout Dark Souls. Um, and if you g meet up with that person at every single situation, then you get some really awesome shit. But you just, like, keep finding them. yeah, but then there's like a couple little branches where like if you show up in this place too early, then you'll have to fight them, and then you and then you kill them, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, but that's that's a thing that leads into what we're thinking of talking about today. Yeah. And what's the, what's that thing? Talking about choice choice in video games which is a very nebulous idea yeah well i mean okay so it kind of encompasses everything because games are interactive right so choice as in narrative choice narrative choice uh path choice how specific way to play a game mm -hmm. um not knowing a, a certain path in a game so we are kind of tackling whatever. all ideas of choice relating to games yeah well i mean this is going to be a 10-hour podcast long, yeah it's going to be a long one yeah well the thing that was um catalyzed it that I thought would make a good topic in my mind was something when we were talking about Chrono Trigger a while ago. Because mm -hmm. I've never played Chrono Trigger. Right. I want to. I'm kind of bummed it's not part of the SNES classic. Not oh, yeah. that I'll be able to find one. But well, Final Fantasy 3 is. Yeah. 6. Still pretty good. Yeah, 6 whatever. <laughs> um, Which if I manage to get an SNES classic, I'll play that because I never played that either. But you were saying yeah. Chrono Trigger is intimidating. Because I looked up, I was like, what should I know if I was going to play it? And every guide is like, at the county fair, make sure you bet on number three and go talk to this guy and then talk to this guy. Make sure you do this before you do that or you're going to have a bad time. And I was like, fuck, how the fuck was I supposed to know that before I started the game? Right. Well, the point is you're not supposed to. Right. But that, but everyone tells you that you are supposed to. Yeah. Not everyone. A lot 
of people. So there's there's this increased importance on knowing shit you're not supposed to know, or like doing the best path, or quote unquote. Right. Um, when it max everything. When in reality, the inti- which 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 is a weird like value system, right? Like, okay, I get it. There is an optimal path, quote unquote. There's a path where you get the most things or see the most things or whatever. Right. But I, but I think the charm of a game like Chrono Trigger, especially because it was obviously um, made to be this way, is that your choices matter and you're not really sure which choices matter. Right, you're always aware of the consequences of your yeah. actions. And then when those things pay off, it's very interesting and, and satisfying, even if it's a bad thing. Right, So, I, and, and I don't know if the, the people who say, oh, no, you should do these things before you start. I, I think it comes from a positive place. Oh, of course. I think it comes from people saying, oh, I had this really difficult time with this part, and if I'd only known this one thing... yeah. Then if I knew that at the fair, if I did this, it would have this kind of consequence. So I want you to have that experience. Yeah, exactly. But it it still comes from a place of knowing. Yes. It comes from a very positive place. It comes from a very personal place too. Because, and and, and that's something that I've experienced through having done Let's Plays for five years is that people, and, and even just being a part of internet communities in general, is people have very personal experiences with video games because they are by nature a personal experience right and people like to share that personal experience with other people Mm -hmm. um but the 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 irony in that is that by sharing your personal experience at least like nudging people towards your personal experience you're sort of robbing other people from having their own personal experience or at least the potential of having a more genuine personal experience of like well i discovered this i had this on my own i figured this out i you know Mm -hmm. that was me inserting myself in this game figuring out these puzzles or going down this path or because i I think especially games that give you a lot of choices be they sort of mechanics wise or or narrative wise it it allows you to sort of put yourself into that experience etc but it also gives you a point of reference to then compare your experience to someone else Mm -hmm. who's played that game so you'd be like oh fuck yeah you didn't have this party member in your team when you went up against that guy oh fuck how'd you do it without that guy yeah which um, is which is interesting to me which is interesting but if someone says oh you need to have this party member with you it sort of robs you of that experience and also kind of it, it, it's also the idea that uh if someone is explaining to you hey you should do this to have x outcome then you're not arriving there on your own yeah because so much of games is is of playing games is sort of understanding their systems mm-hmm and if you don't have that inherent innate understanding that you've developed over the course of playing a game, you're just sort of making decisions blindly. Yeah. And if you're if you're being told what to do, you don't have that understanding. I don't know if I'm making any sense here. Well, yeah, you're saying, um, at least from what I understand, that uh, if a game's not feeding you information about... Uh, a certain thing for you to be informed enough to make a choice. It's like, how could you have made that choice in the first place or something? Yeah, like you're that? just sort of guessing. Yeah. Which is kind of like what I was saying with Dark Souls and your But if that's the intent. Sort of like, how is I supposed to know that? Yeah, yeah. But if that's the intent, then that's also cool. Right. Like what I was saying about Chrono Trigger, it's like the whole point of the game is is to have this sort of like weird because there's 17 endings or something. Yeah, it's not, I don't know. But it, it, so the idea that like you have to do this thing to get the best ending is like well then why did they put 17 endings in the game like mm-hmm. clearly they wanted people to go down all these paths right in, in one way or another wind up at one of those 17 yeah. points and be like here's where i am yeah and and yeah. sort of feel the weight of that um because there's a there's a point in chrono trigger where you can beat the game halfway through the game is it some like silent hill dog ending is that- no it it lit- it doesn't even present itself in a way that's like this is the early ending this is the mm-hmm. wrong ending or whatever it's just like the, you you're given a choice where it's like and it seems such like such a nonchalant choice where you're just like do you want to go fight lavos or not mm-hmm. and and then it's like well yeah you, like you can legitimately because it's so early in the game you're like well i don't know if i'm fucking ready for that right but if you do and you beat them, then you just win. Like you just, that's it. That's the whole point is it's, beat Lavos. It's kind of like, um, did you, did you see the, uh, <clears throat> Far Cry 4 that you can beat that game in like the very first. Oh yeah. You if you have. just sit there and, Cause, and cause not at escape. At the start of the game, you're, you're basically in the antagonist's house. Yeah. And he's like, hold on, I got to take care of something. Just wait right here. And that's when you break out and you join this military movement and you like start this 
resistance to take him down. Or you just wait there, he comes back, you scatter your mother's ashes, and the credits play. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, you didn't have to kill anybody. Which <laughs> is just sort of like, huh. I mean, it is a kind of superficial choice in a way. Like, it's it's kind of meant to be that, like, oh, he's not coming back. But, I don't know, I guess it works. I shouldn't I shouldn't have to devalue that. I think it, it's it's. Clear. Oh, sure. Well, what's the intent, right? Like, Yeah, the intent is, oh, you can get out of this game without killing anyone, which is always like... Are you really the good guy if you're killing hundreds of people? Yeah. Well, I, I think by superficial, you mean like the point that you bought the game for is that you knew you're going to be shooting guys. So. Yeah. It's sort of like a meta narrative. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. Um, so in that sense, I get it. If it were a little more robust and it took you down a completely different path, I think maybe you and other people would think it's less superficial. Yeah. Um, but I still think it's cool. I mean, because yeah. a, a game is a game and an experience is an experience. And if you have that, like imagine being, because I, di I didn't play Far Cry. Mm -hmm. And then when that was sort of discovered, I watched a video and I was like, neat. Right. Imagine being the in and just, ha and then it happens and you're like, whoa, yeah. like what a fucking moment for somebody sure. to, to, to make that realization and have it pay you off. You have to wait for like five or 10 minutes. Yeah. It's like a long time because to sit it, in one place. Everybody who's playing that game now is is doing it because they saw the video or they heard about it, right. you know, but I would never have thought to stay there to make that discovery is very valuable. Yeah. And so I, I think that's, it all stems from this idea. We're, so far, we've only been talking about like one specific kind of choice in games, which is this sort of narrative choice. That's a little bit obfuscated. You don't really understand the consequences. You don't even really understand you're making a choice some of the time. Right. In games like Dark Souls and Bloodborne, you might not realize something is a choice that actually is. And you can just sort of, it, once you have greater context, then you learn, oh shit, that's what I was doing there. Mm -hmm. um, well, that's uh, well, going back to Chrono Trigger, that's it's a pretty interesting thing to say because you know you know I'm all about good tutorials and, and yes. integrated tutorials and stuff. I think we're very like minded on that. Yeah. So C Chrono Trigger has the. I mean, if you don't mind me spoiling it for you a little bit. Nope. Um, there's a fair at the beginning, yes, and there's all these much. there's all these things you can do at the fair. Mm -hmm. um, and there are things that are pay off right away. Or there's things that just kind of happen and you're like, okay. And you sort of have, you don't realize you have agency over it, right? Because you're so used to RPGs. It's just like, sure, well, this, around, talk to the this is a thing I know I can do, so I might as well do it. It's like um, the, the adventure game mindset of pick up everything that's not. Yeah, down. exactly. So there's a, there's a, there, like in particular, there's this one part where there's this guy and he has a lunch. And like, if you talk to him, he's like, oh, I'm so excited for my lunch. And you can see his lunch. And it like looks like a pick upable item, and you can go up and pick it up, and then you just have his lunch, and mm -hmm. you just took his lunch before he was able to eat it. Can you go back to him? Which seems like, so. I think he just says the same thing or something. Okay. Um, but so, but you stole his lunch, like. Mm -hmm. But it, it seems so inconsequential because it's like, oh, I've played so many RPGs, like, like whatever. I'm the protagonist. I just, yeah, I just took his thing. Yeah. Fuck it. Um, but later. Uh, you get arrested for one reason or another and you're on trial and there's all these people from the fair that come and testify okay. against you about against your your character mm -hmm. and like there's all these little moments in the fair that one included where the guy will come up and be like he stole my fucking lunch what an asshole <laughs> um that's awesome yeah but so that th through that whole chunk of the game you have no idea that your choices mean anything until that point and then you're like, oh, now I got to start paying attention because shit matters. Right. So from that point on, every sort of little moment or choice you you you're presented with, you're like, oh shit, this is gonna matter. So I they, better I better matter? make the right choice. What do those choices matter after yes. that point? Of the yes. Game? Okay. Because it's all about time travel. So you'll go back in time uh, and you'll do something, and then in the future it'll be different. Mm -hmm. um, and you can't go back to the past and then revert to that action. Some some things yeah. you can switch. Some things you can't. Okay. And there's also some things that like. Something will happen and you won't even realize that it changed something. And then you'll be in the future and you'll see something and you'll be like, oh, whoa, this is okay. And then you'll like go before that and then like fix it. Okay. Um, I see what you're saying. If I remember that correctly. So you're like having an experience of like, oh, this somehow happened. And then you go back into the past and you're like, oh, this is then. What yeah, yeah, yeah. And you, and you can sort of figure out in your mind like how you would go about Mm -hmm. um, affecting that in the past or whatever. It's a really Good. clever setting for a game. Of yeah. Just very clear cause and effect. I agree. I haven't played Chrono Cross. I'm hoping that it's a lot like that. Mm -hmm. um, I literally know nothing about Chrono Cross, except that it has a thousand characters. 
it's a lot of characters yeah that's like game of thrones yeah well that was like the thing about it it was like <laughs> there's like 100 characters right. you can play as the 50 billion unique sprites it's yeah like, oh, that's not a selling point. yeah well that yeah which makes me think <laughs> like oh man but it kind of right like i was looking up the because the snes classic was revealed like last week or whatever mm -hmm. uh probably a couple weeks prior by the time this airs and i was looking at some of the old box arts that are present on the packaging mm -hmm. and they'll be like eight megabytes of ram and like 256 colors like on the box front of the box prime selling point was like this super super superficial numbers game mm -hmm. that everyone was obsessed with at the time and i was like oh yeah <laughs> what was the box for the super nintendo classic it was like 21 plus one games or something yeah 21 games plus an extra ga or yeah plus no it literally says like 21 plus one games plus one yeah and it's like well, what's like <laughs> Star Fox So it's two. 22 games, like, yeah. or it's 20 plus one. They're just one trying or to point out, like, Star Fox 2. Yeah, is a big deal, right? Which is absurd. Which I, just, I don't give a shit about. I mean, I mean, I didn't even, the first one was kind of, I mean, it, like, it was great at the time, but it's, yeah, hasn't it's aged hard very to play well. an 8 yeah. FPS game yeah, exactly. these days. Like, Stunt Race FX is the same. The way. idea of it is amazing to me that yeah. they're selling a game that has sat in an archive for however many decades. Yeah. That's just kind of neat to me. Well, that's going to sell the console, aside from the fact that it's going to sell anyway. They, they could have just f sold it with, like, fucking Super Mario running, like, like the uh, new... No, what was it? Super Mario All-Stars? It could have been the All-Stars version of Mario 1 running on an SNES emulator, and people still would have bought it. Yeah. They did not have to go as far as they did. Yeah. And it still would have flown off the shelves. I mean, it'd be great so. if they let you virtual console it up and... Wouldn't that be Down something? The, why are we fucking talking, we're talking about choices yeah. in video games? Yeah, talking about choices as a consumer. Um, <laughs> so, uh, another thing that I like talking about is um, choices in, in dialogue. Yeah, okay. We can we can shift to dialogue choices. Because um, <sighs> there, there was a trend during when Mass Effect was really popular with dialogue choices. Um, and they, they sort of... And this is something that goes way back to, but they sort of like fill up a bar or whatever, you know, like with Mass Effect, it's like you choose the Renegade option or you choose the Paragon oh, option. Oh, yeah, yeah, And yeah. then it makes you like more Renegade or more Paragon and that levels like, up certain stats. It, uh, and, uh, what was the superhero game? It's the same kind of deal. Or like Super Fable game. or like, there were a lot oh, of yeah, games yeah. of that era. Um, it was like the lightning guy who would like fire ship. He could be a good lightning guy or a bad lightning guy. It was like a PS3 game. The fuck are you talking about? I think it was Sucker Punch made that. I don't fuck. Whatever. Not worth it. Someone's typing it right oh, now. Oh, 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 oh. It's, it's, uh, the, with the bald guy? Yeah. Infamous. Infamous. Yeah. Thank you. I was like, it wasn't Injustice, because that's the, the yeah. DC game. Yeah, yeah, Um, Yeah, there were a lot of games of that era that were like, oh, are you going to be a good guy or are you going to be the bad guy? Yeah, you it's get like, to make the choice. We're going to take the idea of a... Of like a D and D character alignment mm -hmm. grid, and just compress it into this binary choice. And then if you're in the middle, that's boring as fuck. Yeah. And there's nothing unique about being in the middle. I bothered me. I um, I don't like that uh, because, well, not only is it super limited, but I. Uh, you sort of metagame yourself, I think. Yes, exactly. You a hundred percent yes, because you know. And you really do get a sense, you know, you don't have to have somebody tell you it to speak to what we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. You really don't have to have somebody explain to you, like, you just pick one and go. Right. You get a sense of that, like, pretty quickly. Because like, them will show you a literal bar. They're like, if you get to this level, then you'll knock this Yeah, thing. yeah, exactly. And Mass Effect is like that. If you yeah. if you choose one path, you're you're better off. Mm -hmm. And as opposed to being a little wishy-washy about things. Right. Um, Which, to me, as a player, is more interesting to, to, like, sort of take each conversation as right. it comes. Um, but the, the, the thing that bothers me about it, too, is that it, it's sort of... It has nothing to do... So you're playing a game, right? Like, you know, in a lot of ways, a game is an escape or it's a power fantasy or whatever. And it's like, oh, do what you want. But at the same time, it's still a game. It mm -hmm. has rules and goals and stuff. Sure. So what what bugs me about that is it doesn't give any sense of that there's like... Uh, you're not gaming anything, you know, when you, when you make a choice, when you make a personal choice, because all these designers want you to make like this, like, Oh, heaven or hell choice, you know, like, Oh, do the right thing or the, but doing the right thing in the context of reality still has like consequences and benefits. You're still, you know, technically gaming a system of some kind, even if you're just trying to be a good person right. in, in reality. Um, so my, my, 
my problem with that is they, they don't make it a game. They don't gamify it in some way or another, aside from filling up a bar or whatever, which I don't feel is strong enough. Hmm. So my argument is that like, well, if you're trying to make a point or you're trying to make people choose a right path, like at least make it something that you have to... It's hard to generalize, so I'll just give an example. There's Persona 3... I played Persona 5. It's a little slower and more boring than Persona 3 is to me, but um, Persona 3 and the whole Persona series has this interesting sort of dating game mechanic where like one half of the game is dating games and you have to sort of ingratiate yourself to all these people and then you can earn them for the RPG aspect of it. But the way that you do that is you sort of go out on quote unquote dates with them. Some of them are dudes, some of them are girls and you're not trying to bang them or anything. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, Friendship dates. Yeah. Um, but you get to know them and it's all this dialogue and all this like long winded conversation and like your scenarios and you learn about their life and what they're passionate about. And then there, there are situations where you're faced with a choice um, because they'll say something and they'll ask something and you'll be like, where do you want to go? Mm -hmm. Right. And then you have three choices and you know, in like mass effect, it would be like, well, this is the good choice and this is the bad choice and this is a neutral choice. Right. But in persona, it's all over the map. Like it'll, it'll be like, this is a good choice, this is a bad choice, and this is a really good choice. Or like, mm -hmm. these are all good choices, but one of them is a way better choice. Or these are all bad choices, but like kind of less bad this one is. Right. So, so like you really have to pay attention exactly to like what they're saying and how they're saying it and like the things that they like. And and so when you're faced with those, it's a game. Mm -hmm. It's not it's not just like, well, I feel like I want to be mean. Right. It's, or it's this like, one's colored red, so I'm going to pick that yeah, one. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's like, oh shit, what does she want to hear? Mm -hmm. So you, you really have to think about it and think back to, which I think is like awesome because it's like truly makes it a story game because mm -hmm. you, you actually, listening to the story and understanding the characters is part of how to advance in the game and how to like be good at it. Do you it's, ever it's not have, just like sprinkles. Do you ever have any, do you ever have any incentive in that game to not become friends with someone? Are you always trying to win their favor? I'm just asking you, is there like an opposite version where it's like, oh fuck, she said she likes fish, so obviously she wants to go to the aquarium and you can be like, let's go to the zoo. Because you're like, fuck you, I don't want to be your friend. So you're paying attention to learn to make the worst choice? <laughs> I, you know, it's been a while, so I okay. don't... Because I feel like that'd be an interesting way to get a little bit of extra depth. Out oh, of that yeah, sure. For sure. Because if you're always looking at it with the same mindset, then I feel like over time it sort of loses its its luster a bit. Yeah, well... Because that is really clever, and it's not this binary choice, which I really like. Yeah, but I do think in, in a situation like that, you're still going towards a common goal. Like, for example, hmm. if there's somebody who hates another person, and then you can go on dates with both of them. Like, if you want to get in with this person, then be mean to this person. You know what I mean? Right. So it sort of broadens the horizon of the same goal. Are you saying that is in the game or that isn't? I don't remember. Okay. You don't um, remember seeing it? Okay. Yeah. It, I that mean, would be great if it was. It was like... Because then it just it kind of slightly simulates those complexities of high school drama yeah, in a little bit more exactly. interesting way. But it's like everyone's friends. But the point is there's there's a game to it and it's not yeah. It's it's not like a self-insertion for indulgence, you know? Um because then that's just I don't know. I feel like a game needs to be designed around that aspect to make it interesting at all. To 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 yeah. be like, "Well, I'm going to make my own choice. Fuck it," you know? Mm -hmm. And which I think is tough because then you know, branching paths and all that and right. systemic gameplay. And well, fucking... it is the problem with those kinds of, are you a good guy or a bad guy? Because it's not a series of choices over the course of a game. It's one choice you make, which is the first time you make that choice. Mm -hmm. And then you stick with it for the entirety of, like, I'm a Paragon Shepherd or I'm a Renegade Shepherd. That's just who you stick with. Mm -hmm. And my problem with that, from like a story game perspective, is it becomes very, very superficial. Oh, yeah. Where in all those games, I mean... Well, you don't have a choice. Granted, we're talking about this like it's still a big thing. People don't really make AAA games like that anymore. It hasn't really been a thing in a while. Yeah, yeah. Um, but even when it was at its prime, I think there were a lot of people that were like pro and against it. Uh, con. Pro and con. Um, well, my my point is that like it, it fell by the wayside because people were getting tired of it. And this is the reason why. Well, yeah, so my, my point is that I think I just don't want to give the impression that, like, making a choice is a bad thing, because it's not. No, but I think it's it's very limiting for the player, because then every, it's this sort of metagaming idea of, like, every time you talk to someone, I'm going to make the bad choice. Or mm -hmm. every time 
you know, like in Bioshock, every time I'm going to find a little sister, I'm going to harvest her or whatever it is. Right. Even though being the nice guy and saving them reaps you more rewards in the long run. Mm -hmm. So it's like another level of metagaming on top of that, which is that you're rewarded by, for doing the selfless thing, which isn't true in real life most mm -hmm. of the time. Yeah. Um, I just think that there's a much more organic way to do it where in, instead of it just being this black or white option, you're sort of like in this Persona example, just given more varying degrees where you have to be paying attention and make intelligent decisions because mm -hmm. um, it, it's it's in, in all of those games where you have the, the the good guy or the bad guy there's always this like physical transformation that happens when they become super evil where like in fable you grow horns and become like a demon person you walk up and people run away screaming I'd, i would find it much more interesting if you were playing an rpg where you're an asshole to everyone and people would just learn that you're an asshole organically like you go into a town and kill all this dude's sheep for no reason and he's like, oh, fuck this guy. He killed all my sheep. And you go to another town. They're like, hey, stay away from my sheep. You, you, I talked to this guy. Mm -hmm. And it's not something that they're like, oh, you look like a demon. Yeah. Which is just like super like, okay, who cares? Yeah. Um, and he, or even like, in a game like, like Mass Effect, where it just sort of like unlocks an extra dialogue option. It's yeah, very yeah. kind of superficial. Or like, I can punch this guy now. Yeah. It well, doesn't really have any impact. In a, in a grander sense yeah well a grander sense i think is the the best way to describe it because then that that i think that's what everyone's aiming for they're sort of working from the outside in you know mm -hmm. I, I saw the um beyond good and evil two footage and it was yeah. like this is one city out of a billion that you can go right to. yeah and it's like man that is so not the right way <laughs> to go about doing shit. Because because you and I had the exact same thought. Like, what the fuck are you gonna do in the city if there's right. a million cities? Like, no. how how many resources do you need to make a fucking city interesting like this? So it's gonna be like you go to a city. There's gonna be maybe one important thing there, and everything else is gonna be all this like, you know, randomly generated or well, just yeah, things that just, they just they're point just and click. They're gonna procedurally generate yeah. most of the content, and they talk about. They're, with that game, they're talking about, oh, you start as this, like, really low-class pirate, and you, like, deliver pizzas, and then as you're delivering pizzas, you uncover this bigger conspiracy where there there's human trafficking and stuff, and then you can report them, you can take photos, and then over time you get your own crew, and then you get your own ship, and then you fly onto the galaxy. I'm like, okay, then why do I have to play the game? You just told me literally every step of this process. Yeah. I get no moment of discovery where I'm playing as this, like... Uh, this this delivery person just scrounging for cash, and and then I'll fast forward a, a couple dozen hours, and now my own yeah. pirate adventurer. It's like watching a shitty trailer. Yeah, it's like I, I you just gave me the whole experience. I've played games like that before. Yeah, and you're and and they're trying to say that the scale of it is the selling point. Mm -hmm. And I I like games when they get tighter and smaller. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I played No Man's Sky. And and I think that might be a little bit unfair because they're not making No Man's Sky. Yeah. Uh, and I'm also a big fan of the the original Beyond Good and Evil. You know, I think it, it did a lot of really smart things, even if it is a little bit dated in hindsight. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of really clever ideas in there and a lot of stuff that's carried over to the modern day. Um, but yeah, they, they're taking this really bizarre approach of, of they're going to make a world and you create your own character within it. But to me, you can accomplish the same thing with like a character creation on, a, on a, like a... a, a cre like, create a new character hit start <coughs> excuse me and then you make your monkey dude or whatever it's like even in mass effect when you create a, a shepherd it says which one of these three backstories do you want to choose mm -hmm. right so it's like they could do the exact same thing with beyond good and evil and just skip ahead to the part where you're a pirate king and be like all right how'd you get there if if they're telling me like that stuff doesn't matter what matters is the scale of this thing mm -hmm. right and until they say something else until they get into what you do then that's all that game is to me. I just don't and care about scale, man. It, it's it, you can't. It's impossible. Scale wowed right me now. ten years ago, yeah. and it, it like I remember um, Shadow of the Colossus blowing my mind with mm -hmm. the scale of that. I remember then God of War three, I think. Then I, you fight one of the Titans, and it's like you're the size of a, you, you like ten of you stands up high to be the height of his fingernail. It's like some insane scale like that, and you're like bouncing around in, in real time. And I was just like, I have never seen anything like this before. Mm. And now flying in and out of planets without loading zones. I'm like, okay. Yeah, it's, whatever. It's, it's, it's a tool. It's, it's very it's novel. What yeah. you do with that tech. Mm -hmm. And no, I agree. It's all they're about... They're not making... I mean, I don't know. But so they haven't said anything that excites me. It's just tech, tech, tech. Mm -hmm. And if you have really good tech, then there's a lot you can do with that. But it seems like their focus is on building this seamless universe, not about 
sort of creating this distilled experience that then can transplant across this universe. Yeah, exactly. It has it's like being on this planet is different than being on this planet for these reasons. Yeah. It's like no, you'll just have another procedurally generated city on that planet. Well, it's I don't know. I guess we'll have to wait and see. Um, I think it's it's about systems, right? Because I had I had a sort of moment with uh, Breath of the Wild, which mm-hmm. I loved. Um, yes. But you know, I've seen a lot of the the um, uh, criticisms of it, and which and, and I'm all like, yeah. Because mm-hmm. people are like, well, once you figure it out, it, it becomes kind of rote. Right. Because there's there's a, there's a loop to it, and it's very simplistic. Um, which, yeah, is true. But how long did it take to get to that point? For me, it was about 40 hours. Exactly. For me, it was about 30. <laughs> yeah. So 30 hours of fucking of exploring and being in, wow, wow, that's interesting. Like, mm-hmm. whoa, cool. I didn't know that was a thing. And, oh, I could do this. That's great. You know, wow, yeah. holy crap. I'm having so much fun. And then after 30 hours, I'm like, okay, I go from this place to this place. This game's not really surprising me anymore or whatever. That's 30 fucking hours. That's... Mm-hmm. I, I, it's like it's a lot of time. Twelve movies, mm-hmm. like that's that's a really good amount of entertainment, um, especially for you to be having this active experience with, where you're yeah. having a conversation with the game. So exactly, I'm all about systems, man. Like I, I when I was, um, I think we talked about this on a G Club that we canned uh, about Final Fantasy 15. Um, We're still sitting on that dot wave if people want it. Yeah, but. well. <laughs> There's this moment in Final Fantasy 15 that really made me hopeful about the game, mm-hmm. and it was it's a really early mission where there's a chocobo dealer, and he's like, my I can't run my shop because there's this monster named Dead Eye, who's like killing my chocobo or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so go take care of this Dead Eye monster, and I was like, that's neat because this is an open world. I'm probably gonna like just find him and then mm-hmm. battle him, and that's cool. But no, there's a spot in the game that's like his lair, and mm-hmm. there's a cutscene, and, and there's one entrance point into yeah, the yeah, and then you go through this sort of like semi-scripted sequence where he's like walking outside this tube that you're crawling through or whatever, mm-hmm. and then once you get out of that, then you fight him in this very contained area, um, and there's like a specific way to fight him, and there's like a very specific thing they want you to do with like these little barrels that explode or whatever. Um, and then you go back to him and he's like, great, thank you. And then that quest ends and then you can use his chocobos. Right. It's, it's very like t- EverQuest, like 20 years ago, fucking, I'm giving you a quest, ding, exclamation mark. Now go over here and do the thing that is required of the quest. Come back, quest is complete. Yeah, here's your reward. Right. Um, but the whole time I was going through that, I was just like, I was like, man, how little effort would it take to make this super fascinating Mm -hmm. just on and 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 how much more impact it would have and how much more interesting and even how much more time it would take and be more interesting in that time to ask the ramifications of a quest like that Mm -hmm. to go up to this dude to to like have this thing that you have to go to and you have to use chocobos and you go to this guy and he has a shop. Like, wh- what does it mean that his chocobos are getting eaten by this monster? Okay, he doesn't have a lot of customers. He's losing chocobos, so the prices are ridiculous. Mm-hmm. So you can still get choco. Like, he's not going to fucking close his business. Right. He would still sell them, but it'd be, like, outrageous. And so you'd be like, all right, well, I could, like, pay this price. Mm-hmm. Um, but also... Every night, this guy's fucking eating chocobos. So, like, what if every night there was a less chocobos and the prices, like, went up more? Mm-hmm. Uh, and so you're like, okay, well, I'll help this guy. So you, you agree to help him. And then, or you could, like, find Deadeye in the wild and just he's there. And you're like, this is a monster. I'll fight him. And then you do. And then you show up and he's like, fucking thank God it's gone. Mm-hmm. You know, there was this guy and my prices were crazy and he's dead. And then, like, maybe you could take credit for it or maybe not. I don't know. Right. Um, depending on how you feel or... Like, there's so many like little things you could do with that scenario that are so interesting mm-hmm. and and the game could like just subvert your expectations in so many ways and in so many moments and stuff and like 
you know, you could be like, give me a discount or like, do, you know, is, give me a chocobo now so I can get there, like extort right. him or like. Or if you could just lie and just walk up to him and be like, yeah, I killed it already. Yeah. And he's like, great. And then he gives yeah. you a chocobo for free. And then like, the next day, <laughs> right. fucking chocobos, it's just gone and yeah. you can never get him again. And he's and, like, fuck you. Yeah. Um, or like opens up a different business or whatever. He's like, fuck it. I don't want to deal with chocobo shit anymore. Or like, you know, yeah. like there's just. And and obviously that takes a thousand times more work to do. Right. But it's so much more interesting. Mm -hmm. And even if the game was like fucking three hours and it had that moment in it, like yeah, I would remember it forever. Mm -hmm. Like how how interesting that was, and 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 how I would want to go back to it and be like, how else could I experience this moment, right? But, yeah. But then to go back to um that scenario we were talking about at the beginning of the of the podcast is like i can see why people don't want to do that because we've been so programmed to believe that there's an efficient path right mm -hmm. that if if that were the case and it were so sort of not open-ended but like there were so many different ramifications right to, depending on how you treat the situation you there would be there would immediately be like do it this way online and everyone would know to do it that way yeah and it would sort of completely devalue the whole discovery process of it well that's that's also why i like when you're given choices where there is no best answer because if, oh, yeah. if there's one clear well there's always best a best path, answer i mean there doesn't have to be though i mean in a game like an rpg where you have a goal and you're trying to get to the end boss sure but um, I mean, the, the first example that comes to head, comes to mind, is um, Heavy Rain, which a lot of people shit on, but I actually really like a lot of... I love Heavy Rain. I like a lot of the ideas that it put into it. Yeah. And some of the moments from Heavy Rain have stuck with me to this day, like, yeah. very vividly. And there's one that's, I think... I don't think it's the first. I think it's, like, the second or third, like, uh, trial thing you have to go through as the father, um, where he has to cut off his finger. Mm -hmm. And... In, in the game, you sort of, you walk into a room, and so the point is, like, you're being subjected to all these trials, and every time you, you finish one successfully, you're given another couple of letters in the address of where your son is being held. So you can get to the end of the game and have failed a bunch of them, and it's just sort of like, all right, where do you want to drive to try to save your son? And if you have incomplete information, it's like, well, are you going to go to Rover Street or River Street? It's like, it kind of lets you sort of be in his shoes a bit. Mm-hmm. But with the so basically from every single challenge you can just walk away. That's sort of the the setup. Yeah. Um. And so the, this this little robot voice is like, all right, you gotta cut off your finger, and here's a webcam. We're gonna watch you cut off your finger. If you don't, then you fail this challenge. And so you're you're immediately able to just be like, fuck this, I'm out. But if you're like, no, I'm gonna stay and like think about it. You're in this this apartment uh, building, and the the room that you're in is full of all these different tools. There's cutting tools, there's stabbing tools, there's all kinds of shit. So you very quickly realize this game is making me choose how I'm cutting off my finger. Mm. Which is like, there is, is there a best? So it's like you're walking around and there's a, like a timer and even like the in-game prompts to pick stuff up are super shaky and jittery to like sort of emulate the, the character freaking out. And you have to choose, okay, uh, I'm going to pick up these scissors. No, wait, I found a knife. The knife is going to be better. Oh, I found a better knife. Okay, I'm going to pick this up and you're like dropping shit and moving things around. And if you go into the bathroom, you can find, like, uh, rubbing alcohol, like, disinfectant. I found a, uh, I think it's, like, a piece of rebar that you can heat up to, like, cauterize the wound. So you can put that on the table next to you, and you you basically set it up, and then you have to sit down and, like, do it. And it, like, that entire sequence has stuck with me so vividly of, like, to me, that was the, the peak of what everything that Heavy Rain was trying to do. Mm. Because it's giving you this situation, the stakes are really high, and there is no best answer. Because no matter what you do, if you cut off your finger, he lives, you know, you don't bleed out, um, and you, you move on to the next thing. So it's sort of about the, the, the story element of it, the fiction element of like, well, if I was in his shoes, I would want to cut off my finger like this, and I want to disinfect it and cauterize it and wrap it with a bandage. So that's what I did in the game. Or you could use, like, rusty scissors and take half an hour hacking away at your hand. Like, yeah. it's it's... You're not going to find in a walkthrough, like, be sure to do this. Because that's not what that part of the game is about. It's mm -hmm. about kind of getting inside your head a little bit. And and to me, those kinds of choices are much more interesting because it's not binary. The, the larger binary choice is do you cut off your finger or do you not? Mm -hmm. But then within 
those specifically if you do cut your finger it's like well which of these 30 permutations do you want to explore and it's all under a time limit and you're freaking out Mm -hmm. so it's like to me that's interesting and and i think that there's a version of that that you can apply to even something like a final fantasy 15 where you're given these multiple options of okay you're yes you're gonna take this quest but there's ramifications Mm -hmm. there's okay yeah you're gonna help out the chocobo guy but what about his competitor like in the next town over like are you gonna help out him too and like now you're like raising up the prices for everything or like i think that there's ways you can turn any individual plot line in an rpg and and give them more depth oh yeah and even even a very superficial like design ethos of just every positive outcome has a negative outcome however big or small Mm -hmm. i think even something like that it takes it away from this idea of like i am the hero and nothing i can do is wrong i'm the good guy i'm the paragon or i'm the bad guy i'm the renegade because even if we've gotten we've gotten away from those bars of the renegade and the paragon i think that we still have a lot of that in our games it's just a little bit um it's just it's, it's just kind of more blurred more wishy-washy of just mm-hmm. kind of like uh, you can just sort of do stuff that's good or bad um but there's there's not a whole lot of impact and significance to that and i think it's it's again it's a systems driven approach of something like breath of the wild where you have these clear rules and things impact each other but you're just sort of applying that to a social structure in, in addition to just like physics um and i think that would be a very interesting situation where you're making decisions that impact different things and you're sort of learning about them, kind of like a Chrono Trigger thing. I'm just sort of combining all these ideas at this point. But. Right. Well, I'm not understanding you completely, I don't okay. think. Because it feels like you were saying two conflicting things. So you're explaining... I sort of start to run my mouth and then I lose track of what I'm saying. So. Well, it was it was just the example, the heavy rain example was mm-hmm. like, you have all these possibilities or whatever, but they don't mean anything? Well... It's the the idea. Oh, so I think that there could have been a a slightly deeper version of what they did in Heavy Rain, where you know if you cut your finger with these five things over here, then that has this impact. And if you cut your hand with these five things, like you bleed out or whatever it is, right. like having there be an extra layer on top of that. But the idea is that it doesn't mean anything. It's 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 a story game, so it's trying to appeal to your emotions. It's trying to tell a story. Right. If if we're talking about a, a much more mechanics minded game then this stuff doesn't apply most of the time right. I would say so it's it's not about um, does the choice matter or not it's about making a choice that's not black or white because right. they could have just said are you going to cut off your finger and then had a knife on the table with you ready to go and you're just like okay chop and you don't really think about it right but it's the, the act of like having to prepare for it and think through the steps of what that involves and then having to carry it out that makes that loop meaningful it's still with the because the only reason that you have any sense of tension in that situation is because you want to make the right choice but the right choice involves bodily harm that's sort of the right the whole constraint with that because i I don't see how that's relevant though um well yeah if you if you distance yourself from the entire game then yeah you don't care if anyone lives or dies and you're like okay i don't fucking care if he loses a finger well because yeah well right it only works if you care about anything that's happening. And well, that's out of the designer's hands. Is it, though? Yeah. I feel like it's your job as a designer to make you care. Well, they have to do their best, but they can't make you feel anything. Well, right. But, I mean, w- within the rules of the game, mm-hmm. you, you have to care. Uh, yeah, what I'm saying is, like... It's about... Because you're, you're saying all you could do is put a knife on a table and hit A to chop off your finger. Mm-hmm. But that's essentially what they're doing they're just giving you more ways to do it right but there's no ramifications to just taking the knife and doing it or doing the whole thing with the bandage and everything mm-hmm. um yeah there's no there's no difference between those paths in, and be, in, in like a clear uh game sense they'll have the same outcome okay but it's the it's the you're right i'm not making any sense it's like a nolan movie it's like strings you along but when you think about it you're like oh no because so it's 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 the interactivity of that segment. It's not just, do I pick? It's not like if you were sitting at the table and you have a knife on one hand and scissors on the other hand, it's like, which one do you use to cut you off your finger? That's not very interesting. But to me, it's the, the, the act of having to physically walk around that room and, and deal with this, this idea of like, how am I going to solve this problem in mm-hmm. the best way that I can? 
and you're using all the tools they have available, which are really shitty. But has the game given you any indication that that matters up until that point? Um, probably not. I'd have to play through it again. I mean, I'm not but, discounting the experience that you right. had. Um, I, I, I'm just, if I were playing that game, um, if I were at that moment, cause I don't really remember, I just remember the part where you cut your finger off or not right. in my mind. Yeah. Um, you don't remember like the tension and not really. Out and well, I, I remember being like, should I, or shouldn't I? Right. But beyond um, that, you were like, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, from my perspective, I would have liked to had some indication that, like, oh, if I did it dirty, it would be bad. If I did it clean, you know, maybe sure. there would be some different outcome. I mean... But I don't know. You know, like, like for example, I mean, just as a dirty example, you know, it's like in the Saw movies, the guy's always like, oh, you gotta learn a lesson or whatever. So, like, the whole point's learning a lesson. So, it's like do I want to do it clean or do I want to do it dirty so that like he thinks that I'm teaching myself a lesson, mm -hmm. you know, and then do it. It's still a game, right? Right. Well, I, so I, I was thinking of it more in the, the context of, of just what will make this experience the least dreadful for the, the character. Um, if like, if I'm the puppet master, I don't want to torture this guy. Mm -hmm. Um, so I want to find the the best version of this, which involves cleaning the wound and, and dressing it. Right, and but that's still a ramification. That's an outcome to the end of the... You're still solving a problem, but then at the end, the game's telling you that there was no problem to solve. Right, So isn't but, that a little upsetting? Well, so now we're getting into this idea that... Uh, at least I, I think... We're, we're sort of talking about real choice, quote-unquote real choice, versus the illusion of choice. Right. Which is this, in hindsight, did any of it matter? Mm -hmm. Which you can be a nihilist and say none of it matters. But it, it's it's kind of like a problem, I think, with a lot of modern Telltale games. Where you're given these choices that will send you on different branches. And an hour or two down the line, those branches collapse back into one. Mm -hmm. Where it doesn't really matter what you did, we're still going to kind of move this way. Right. Or you say, no, I don't want to do that. And another character goes, let's do it. And you do it anyway. Right. So it sort of takes away your agency as a player because you're like, none of my choices matter. Um, besides any sort of meeting that you ascribe to them as a player. Mm -hmm. um, and there is no easy answer to that. I, I think I think the illusion of choice is... I think it can be a very powerful tool. I think in the case of having to cut off your finger, I'm not sitting there wondering, you know, because the, the I think the metaphor is very clear of like, you're cutting off your finger and these are the steps of that. It's not a very abstract thing. Um, so... If you cut off your, your finger, you know, am I going to bleed out if I don't wrap it with a bandage? Mm -hmm. I don't know that. The answer is no, but that's only knowable with hindsight. Right. In that moment, if you are trying to think these things through as your character, for me, it was a very clear choice of like, I, it's not enough to just cut off the finger. I need to think about what's next. And the game gave me those tools to be like, yes, you can disinfect it. Yes, you can even cauterize it if you're going that extreme with it. Mm -hmm. Um and so maybe originally they had plans that you would bleed out or whatever, and playtesters didn't realize that there was more than just the first thing they could, pick, they could pick up. You know, maybe that's what happened. That people were like, oh, I found a knife, and they just did that and moved on with the game. Mm -hmm. Like, why did I die? Like, I didn't know I was going to die. Because also, that game doesn't let you reload your saves. You know, it's, a, it's all about sort of like living with those decisions. I think you, you can load saves, but it's, characters can die and the game just continues. Like, that's, that was the big selling point of the game at the time. Yeah, which is um, which is one of the things I love about that game. Yeah, unfortunately, no one really can die until pretty late in the game, but yeah. it does work. Well, it's um, just it's just such a actual horror game. Yeah, because keeping game mechanics in mind is that like you can have a horror game and it can startle you, mm -hmm. but to be truly scared, being scared is a is a like a primal response to like stakes. I was like, yeah. I could die right now, therefore I am scared. Right. Um, but in a video game, you always have the option to respawn or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are games that aren't meant to be scary that can be scary just mechanically because there are a ton of stakes. Like, there's the save point was like an hour away and you got all this shit and now you're in the situation where you don't, and it's very scary. Mm -hmm. So when Heavy Rain came out and that was the thing, it's like, you just can't go back. Right. That's like, well, that's a true any time. So yeah. Be fucking careful. That's a true horror game because you're just constantly afraid of the unknown. And you, I think games have to say things like that if if that is what they're exploring. Because 
it's like with with Chrono Trigger, if they didn't do that whole court scene where they're like, there are consequences to your actions. Exactly. You probably wouldn't go through the game thinking that that was the case. Yeah. You'd which was like, oh well, that's weird that that happened. Which was my point with the the finger cutting off thing, and why I said it's the designer's um, uh, responsibility to make you care, because mm-hmm. it was the designer's responsibility to make you aware of the stakes. Um, well, you do know the stakes in, in that if you leave, it'll make your job of finding your son that much harder. Right. But so also, well, I'm talking specifically about choosing how you cut off your finger. Right. I don't think there's any nuance in the, the parts before that. Yeah. It's just like you did it or you didn't. Because it should be clear sort of um, what the objective or, or at least like somewhat the ramifications are. Mm-hmm. And they well, can't get to choose which finger you cut off. I forgot that part. Okay. But, it, I mean, it can be ambiguous, too, you know, it's like in the sense of that. Um, but my my point is, and you mentioned Telltale, too, which is interesting because those are games that really strike me as they just want to give you choice. You know, that's the objective. It's yeah. like it's like outside in thinking, like we want to give the people choices. We want to give them three choices. Some of them matter, you know, mm-hmm. like some of them don't really, they go down the same path, whatever you say, maybe someone says something different. Right. Um, but it's still, you still go the same way. Yeah. Like the paths never really branched that far. I, I, if it does exist, I'm not aware of it, but there are, don't seem to be any games that are th- designed inside out in the same way. The whole Chocobo thing is we're thinking about like what you want to do with the player where like every fucking choice is important and they only give you choices when they specifically want you to make a choice that's very important and has something to do with something. And even if it's not narrative or something, because when we talk about choice, um, it, it, I, I feel like you're constantly imposing choices on yourself when you have agency as a player in any way. Right. Um, and ramifications aren't necessarily so clear or as valued in most players. For example, you can make the choice in Dark Souls to not equip the best weapons, and mm-hmm. the ramification is you're making things harder for yourself. Right. You know, and that is a choice. It's not a narrative choice or whatever, but it's still a choice, and it gives you a lot more immediate consequence than, you know, Zelda's the same way. Like, you got the breakable weapons. You can use this weapon but then it's gonna break and it's not gonna so you can save it for something else you know it's a Mm -hmm. choice that you're making right um so to make a narrative driven game where you're making choices is is a lot more difficult because you have to think of every single ramification right because because there are a lot of systems driven games where to 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 throw out my favorite word ludo narrative mm -hmm. becomes the name of the game and and little narrative is just a, a story that's told through gameplay. Mm. So everything from a game of Minecraft to a game of soccer is a little narrative where you're like, oh, yeah. this happened and then this happened. It's nothing that was authored and, and written as like this happened and then this happened and they went down this path. It's like just comes out of the mechanics in motion, yeah. the different systems. Um, but in in something like The Sims or or Dwarf Fortress, you have all kinds of stories being told spontaneously by the systems that are underneath it all. Oh, yeah. Um, so it definitely does exist in those kinds of extreme examples. Um, but I don't think that's as much what we've been talking about up until now. But we can absolutely talk about the crazy shit. Or like D&D even. It's like pure authored, like freeform oh, content. Yeah. Where, absolutely. Absolutely. Where like literally your imagination is the limit. Yeah. And there are rules to D and D, but there's, there's not so much a system. Well, there's rules, but it's up to the DM to sort of. Yeah, exactly. Craft that experience. Um, but when it comes to a video game, you're, you're, you're playing a system. Yes. You know, you're playing more or less set in stone. You're playing ones and zeros. So, yeah. um, it has to be more deliberate. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is why, you know, again, with like narrative, choice driven games it, it baffles me that these stories aren't written from the inside out like there there don't seem to be any stories that are written almost like Stephen King style where it's just like I'll just start mm-hmm. and then oh I'm interested in giving the player this choice and I'm interested in exploring both of those choice paths and like where they go it's just yeah. th- there's a point where the tree branches out so far like there's nobody could ever fucking write that many branches right and it would take a thousand years to create all those assets yeah yeah so the idea is that somebody writes a story and it's like well let's put choice in there and it doesn't really 
Mm-hmm. Of, uh, somebody dies. I don't know. But the, it always ends up the same. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, well, I mean, you also, you do, we haven't talked about um, a lot of Western RPGs like like Fallout or Elder Scrolls, which do give you a lot of freedom. I don't have a lot of experience with them personally, mm-hmm. but you do have a lot of freedom. They do have like karma systems and, and, and things like that. Um, which is kind of back to that black and white morality kind of thing we were talking about before. Mm-hmm. But you do have the ability to just like walk into a town and kill the mayor and the entire town hates you. You can just completely break the game where you can't finish the main yeah. critical path yeah. because you killed all these important NPCs or whatever. Right. And in that sense, then that's like a lot. It's like it's like halfway to fulfilling this sort of dream that we have of, of this systems driven narrative space mm-hmm. where you have this authored content clashing against the agency of the player. Yeah. Um, and to see that go even further and sort of take in these lessons from, from some of the games we've been talking about, like this Chrono Trigger idea mm-hmm. and this Breath of the Wild idea of, of these systems-driven ideas. I wonder if it's too large scale. I think it, so. I, <laughs> I, think, I think something has to give once you start having that many yeah. permutations. So we were talking about Majora's Mask. Yeah. That's and how example. it's just one town. And you on a can, three day loop yeah and you learn about all the people and it's not so much about choices it is about like figuring out how the town works and that's what the game is yeah you never really make choices that impact the NPCs beyond yeah. like this is the quest which does these things right um, but if there was a, a game where there were choices that you were affecting um, you know I, I feel like it wouldn't branch out too far and that would be pretty fucking interesting you know like mm-hmm. I don't know how much playtime you get out of that, and it's probably a lot of work to do, but it would be interesting to see somebody at least try to start making a game like that where there is a narrative tree and it just goes and you're just like, where would I don't know? I'm just making choices, man. I just, right. Maybe this is, will affect it. You know, obviously the game's informing you a little bit about like what might happen if you do that. Yeah. Um, but uh, I just think it's, it's, it's got to be just impossible to, oh, for sure. to, to create something because you can create something like that that is kind of procedural where you sort of put in some types of situations as a designer and say, OK, these kinds of um, conversations can take place, these sort of dialogue and they sort of like slot out the variables just like, OK, now you're talking about a tree, you're right? talking mm-hmm. about a village. Um but would that be good? You know, it's like, yeah, it would be telling your story, but it'd be really boring and nothing. You'd never have like a new element come into that. Um, once you get far enough down the tree, so you're like on a random branch by yourself. No other player has ever gotten there before. And it's like, there's not gonna be some new event that only happens to you by the time you get there. It's just impossible to create that much content. Um, mm. And if you're creating a big authored story, it just behooves you to make the stuff that everyone will see as good as possible and put less effort to the branching paths. Mm. Um, Which is why I think something like Dark Souls is very effective because you don't have a branching narrative in as much as you have a slightly evolving world and you're just sort of placed inside of it and, you know, you can go down, down, like the, 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 the hidden content is in the world itself. It's not really locked behind NPCs as much. Mm. I mean, there probably is examples where it is, but um, I don't know. I, I think that that approach is is working very, very well, and and I would love to see more games like that. Yeah. Because um, then also you have more of these organic choices where you're bumping up against NPCs that you don't understand, and you're having to make decisions about them. Mm-hmm. Um, and and you do have the experiences that you have, unlike in Final Fantasy 15, you have the you can talk to someone, they'd be like, oh yeah, like there's this like giant like ogre thing or whatever, like. But they'll speak in riddles because nothing makes sense. And then you just find some giant demon thing like hanging out in the corner. And you're yeah. like, okay, I got to fight this now. Like there's just always something to explore. And that's kind of like the, the initial 30, 40 hours of Breath of the Wild as well, where you're constantly learning how that system works. Mm-hmm. Um, and as you're learning it, you learn what the consequences of your choices are in whatever game it is. Um, Man, I just think of fucking so- <laughs> like... You know, you and I play Overwatch mm-hmm. frequently, and people still don't know how SR works, how skill rank works. I mean, I don't fully. And, and it's just funny how they can invent such a simple thing, mm-hmm. such a complex algorithm behind it. Right. People still haven't fucking figured it out. 
and and you, like why like, I don't know. It's so like, like why, designers oh, are capable of making really complex shit. Yeah, and it's yeah. so simple. It's it's such a fucking. Well, I don't know how simple it is, but but it's just <laughs> well, when you were talking about that stuff, I, I was I was I was like, man, I want I wonder. You know, I don't know if it would be good or bad, but I wonder in a scenario like like I was talking about with the Chocobo guy, mm-hmm. imagine there were two places, right? And they had like a relationship, right? Mm-hmm. So like. You know, this guy talks to this guy frequently or whatever. And and there are things in the game that are sort of Renegade Paragon-esque where you're like filling up a bar or you have like a meter or something where people... And there's like a... Ch- there's a higher chance of changing things. So like if you do something for some other guy, you know, he's always talking to this guy. So like his information might get to that guy that you helped him out and then he might give you a discount. And in other people's games, like depending on how sort of dependable you come off because of other shit that you've done, that, you know that bar is a little bit higher so in my game i get a 10 percent discount but in his game he got like a 15 percent discount mm-hmm. that's just really almost inconsequential but i'm just saying like you could bring numbers into it sure um and and in ways to integrate numbers algorithmically so that um you know you're, you're sort of getting a a sense that you're making a difference Absolutely. It, well, and and I think it, it speaks to this idea of what I want out of choices in games, which is these non-binary decisions, mm-hmm. this stuff that is more systems driven and just sort of embeds you into that world a little bit more where it's not, does this guy love me or hate me? It's like, well, how much of a percentage of a discount can I get from him? Yeah. It's it's not a, a, a black or white issue. Um, I just like those kinds of choices that, that, require you to to use your brain and not just like blindly hit the yes button or always hit the left option or whatever yeah, it is like yeah. that's when i start to tune out and that's when i'm skipping through all this shit mm-hmm. and the more i feel like every conversation matters big or small or a small conversation can you know just build and build into all of a sudden it has big ramifications like the more that happens the more i'm invested into reading all this shit in this game the more yeah. i care about the consequences of my actions because so much of playing games is exploring your own agency as a player Mm -hmm. and learning what you can do and sort of pushing up against it's like when you walk into a town and fall and you're like i wonder if i can shoot the the fucking priest okay boom i did great now the priest is dead it's like people don't do that because they're like oh fuck priests it's just like well i want to see if i can yeah exactly it's it's, um i remember I, I, i i attended this talk that um richard lamarchand gave who was the lead designer on I think Uncharted 2 and 3, and now he works as a teacher at USC with their games division. And he was talking about in Uncharted 2, there's a a scene where you're sort of left for dead in a snowy mountaintop, and this man finds you, and he rescues you. Oh my god, I need water. Mm -hmm. Um, Excuse me. And he um, takes you back to his village and like helps patch you up or whatever. And then you have a moment where you get to walk through and it's like one of the only parts of the game where there's no shooting or jumping around and stuff. You just get to walk around this nice scenic mountaintop village and there's kids running around playing. There's all these yaks hanging out and there's women doing stuff. And it's just like this like nice little town and you go through it and then like more plot happens and you go start killing people again or whatever. Um, not that the killing people is bad. <laughs> it's just it's it's a it's a starkly contrasted experience. Right. right but they right. said that when they were playtesting the game every single person would try to punch the kids yeah every single play tester and for a long time the designers were like what is wrong with our play testers why are they so evil why do they want to do these terrible things and it was only because they were trying to express their agency they were trying to find out what can i do are there consequences to my actions can i punch a kid will it make him fall down will it make him cry will it make his parents mad at me like what is gonna happen mm-hmm. it's the it's the, the idea of gta of like the sandbox where i can be an asshole and it's not pure power fantasy though that is a certain amount yeah, of it. it's just like stimuli. it's like what can i do yeah. what happens what what are what's the depths of this simulation mm-hmm. and so they didn't want you punching kids as nathan drake right so they they put in a wave so when you hit the punch button you wave at them or when you walk up to a yak and you punch you you pet them and he like has a little moment with mm. the yak and it's like as a player that's what happened to me i walked up to a yak and i was like i wonder if i can punch it and he gave it a little pat and there was like a little animation the yak was like happy about it, and i was like it was such a wonderful little moment yeah. of, of discovery of like, that's my agency here. Yeah. Now I get it. Yeah. Like it's really satisfying when that happens. And that can also and, say a lot about, you know, the artist's intent. Exactly. And that there's a lot that you can do. That's again, this like conversation between the game and the player. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think it speaks to this idea that like, 
we want our choices to have consequence. We want to find our own agency. We want to find the limits of what we can do mm -hmm. in the space, especially when you have like humanoid NPCs that you can interact with. I think these things kind of trail off once you get more abstract and make it more of a quote unquote game. Mm -hmm. um, well, that's, that's why I think I sort of get a reputation for not liking stories in games, but that's not true at all. I just, I hate like, shitty stories and yeah, games. Yeah, it's like when I, wanted, when I was talking about Persona, it's like, I'm invested in every fucking conversation because I know it matters. Right. So, I love story in that game, right? Mm -hmm. um, but in a game where it's an RPG and I know the system already, mm -hmm. it's very clear what the system is, and then I get some buddy talking about the fucking castle or whatever, it's like... Well, I don't give a shit because I know it doesn't matter. Right. But if 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 there was a game like that where like everything everybody said was like at least important in some way mm -hmm. and wasn't just like world building or it's my fucking least favorite like it's such a cop out answer. It's, yeah. it's world building. It's like building what world? It's there's no it's not a fucking novel. Like it's it's a I can see the castle. It's right. It's huge. Right. I already had my own world building experience where I took a look at it and I was like, mm -hmm. wow, what a grand somebody rich must live in there. So, you know, like sure. I don't need somebody fucking telling me about how it's in 1800s or whatever unless it is relevant to something I'm going to do or say later mm -hmm. um and i th the reason i'm so cynical about it is because i know no games are going to do that and so, so i i lose interest immediately because and, and and you know it's it's on me but it's also on like modern games in general where it's like no games have given me the impression that watching the fucking introduction cutscene where there's some dude fighting a dragon and, blah, blah, and it's just explosions and oh no the kingdom's in peril and yeah. like I don't especially I, in Dark Souls where you have no context for any of the shit you're seeing yeah it's like I don't get I don't get, I don't <laughs> it doesn't matter the way the story works in Dark Souls f yeah so many cutscenes only make sense after like 50 hours in those worlds right like I'm gonna sh it's I'm gonna spawn and there's gonna be a zombie in front of me I'm gonna have to hit a to kill it like it's it has nothing to do with what I'm actually doing right um but if it did if there was something that I had to learn from that stuff Mm -hmm. that would help me or um i don't know that made some kind of difference in what well, i was doing game, actually as agency in the game then i would care about if the it's story. a game where cutscenes give you crucial information then it would make sense to start a game with a cutscene and then very early on be like did you fucking pay attention yeah exactly and then the player's like oh fuck i better pay attention yeah exactly the chrono trigger example mm -hmm. Um, and, and and I know a lot of people are going to be like, well, they do give you information. It's like, yeah, they do. And then they put it in a fucking journal and then well, they and then they put it in red and it's like, go here. Like, yeah. it, it's not it's not that important. I'm talking about like something that would inform your decision to do or go or have some kind of agency in where it's not explicitly pointed out in some other way because cutscenes will be like go here and hit the stone with your sword whatever and it's like okay great and then you the game has a fucking straight line on the gps that is leading you there and then you get there and there's an exclamation mark on it and it's glowing and you hit it like that is what's informing me that this rock is important not the fucking cutscene right that didn't matter yeah because it literally just told me again with the game to do the exact same thing mm-hmm um, so I'm, I'm talking about like, if there was a scenario where none of that shit was there and there was just a fucking rock in front of a cave and you had no idea, mm -hmm. why would you even think to hit it with your fucking whatever right. magic sword? But if somebody's like the magic fucking sword, you got it. And it's like, oh shit. I that's, that's a real surface level well, example that, that I, I wish was more present in breath of the wild. Cause there is a little tiny bit of, of, I think what you're getting at, which is like, this idea of if it's just there in the world with no fucking prompts and cutscenes, you're going to walk right by it. Mm -hmm. But if someone tells you, hey, there's a rock in this place. If you hit it with your sword and this thing happens, you'd be like, oh, fuck, I need to look for that rock. Yeah. So there, there's like one or two quests in Breath of the Wild that are like that. Mm -hmm. um, there's one in particular that I'm remembering that's like kind of in the eastern part of the map. Um, and you find these this, you know, NPCs and they're talking about this thief who is this amazing thief and he hid his bounty mm -hmm. at the top of a waterfall. And you have to like, and there's like a rhyming riddle or, or some shit that like sort of teases that, oh, you have to find a bunch of rocks that lead up a river and like follow that river all the way up. And it's a river that's not very far from where they tell you that. Mm -hmm. But I just had this like, oh my God, it, it, it felt like, like playing an old school adventure game yeah. uh, for a brief moment where I was like, oh my God, like this world is boundless. Like yeah. there's just shit hidden everywhere. And 
as much as I think the Korok seeds are, are a really interesting uh, reward system for paying attention to your environment, mm -hmm. I wish there was more stuff like that. Yeah. That was just sort of embedded in the world and just sort of well, that's when there for you to discover randomly or for an NPC to kind of guide you. Well, that's the epitome of like system solving, right? Like mm -hmm. after 10 of those, you're like, oh, well this kind of scale of puzzle i'm just gonna end up with a fucking korok seed you know yeah it's like i'm not i'm not discovering anything anymore well that's also that that's like the difference between really like pure story games and then games that have other kind of systems at play because yeah. a story game can reward you with more story and that's literally all you need yeah that's fine but for a game like breath of the wild you need to figure out what the rewards are for players doing things yeah and that could just be a vista it could just be a korok seed but I think you run out very quickly of, of ways to really find rewards for the player. Yeah, yeah. Um, but part of it's part of the sense of the discovery, too. Yeah. I, th I think I think even just having an NPC be like, holy shit, you found that thing? No one's ever found that before. Yeah. That can be enough sometimes. I think I've... Uh, but it's about the way that it's done. Yeah, I agree. Um, and and I, I think a lot of these games um, sort of give bad examples of... Uh, of scenarios where I don't know how to explain it, so I'll just give an example. Uh, I was thrilled when I was playing Breath of the Wild and I ran across some fucking random NPC that was like walking on the road or whatever. And then I went up to them and they were like, Oh, yeah, this is a place nearby. It's like in the fork in the road, you go left, it's Kakariko, you go right, it's whatever. And you follow the river past Kakariko and that takes you to the, the lake or something. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Cool. <laughs> yeah. If I remember that mm -hmm. and go north and follow that, I'll get to where he said that's neat. Right. That's something that I'm, I have to do as a somebody who's playing the game. It's as not pile, just fuck. As a pile of meat holding a piece of metal and plastic. But also if I hit start and then zoom in on the map, it literally says fucking lake right here. And there's a t like, I don't need that. Yeah. So it's it, the game's working against itself in this mm -hmm. for somebody to stop me and say, hey, let me waste your time for a second and tell you about this thing that you could easily get the information for right. on your own without me. I, um, I agree. But I also think I'm the weird kind of player that doesn't mind when a game requires I take out a piece of paper. I, I kind of no uh, I love I, I, I'm saying I love that I, I I think we're of the same mind I don't think a lot of people are like that way I think a lot of people don't want to think that hard when they play a game like that they want to just sort of get immersed in the world and explore all the but things but that's only and, because we're we're so used to it every fucking game does it like well, it used and, to mean, and, like, and, an adventure game demanded things of you. Exactly. And now an adventure game is you go on an adventure, which but, is a very d different thing. I, I keep mentioning it, but it's the it's the designer's job to... Because I think the designer did a... I mean, fucking Breath of the Wild is a triumph, but there's plenty of stuff like that that I feel doesn't do itself credit. Like, mm -hmm. the designer didn't do a good job of making that moment important. They're they're mm -hmm. giving you that information, but it's completely antithetical to the way that the game functions. Right. Um, but if if the designer wanted that moment to be important, then it would have to be important by the value that it gives you as a player. It's, it's, oh, I didn't know that before, mm -hmm. and that's the only way I can get that piece of information, and it's really important that I know that. Mm -hmm. So. Of course you would want to take out a pen and paper and write it down. And then you're setting the precedent for the player to have to do shit like that. Yeah. Um, but to do that is just a waste of time at that point because you have a better function right off the bat of of performing what this person's asking of you. Of just opening up the map. Yeah. Yeah. So Well, I think it's also that there is a middle ground. I think some games have done this where if someone tells you something it's sort of recorded within the game itself. Like some games have literally yes. had logs of everything yeah. everyone says to you that you can just open up like a script and, and skim through. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there is a version of that where, you know, NPCs can tell you things and you can open up the map and then maybe you've bought a map in this area so you have names on everything. Maybe you didn't buy a map over here so you just have the topography but you don't have names of stuff. And so this guy would be like, you gotta go over Crescent Hill and then make a left at the spooky forest. And... Maybe you just sort of see that on your map and you're like, okay, I think it's over here. And then you can mark it as a player and it, and, and it's like, it's, it's, it's not tracked as a quest exactly where mm -hmm. it's like, you need to talk to uh, the, the gatekeeper at this place. 
It's just, you talk to this dude, here's what he said, now you can take that text and pin it to your map. Yeah. And you can be like, I, I don't know, I'm just going to pin it where he is, because I have no idea where he's talking about. Or you can be like, I'm going to pin this riddle about the river over at this river, because I think that's where it is. And, it's, and then you can go to your map and then be like, what's this tag over here? And you click on that, and it sends you to that block of text. You're like, yeah. oh, this guy told me about that. And like, then it's all within the game, but it still gives you those tools to discover those things. Yeah. It doesn't require a pen and paper, because it's a little bit old school. Yeah. But well, it still fun. rewards you for paying attention and for being active in this world and right. trying to discover its yeah. mysteries. Not just, here's a point on your map. Go there. Yeah. Which, which, I had the same experience with Breath of the Wild, where when you first leave the plateau and the old man is like, see those hills in that fucking distance? You gotta go beyond that shit. And I was like, this world is huge. And he's giving me directions by pointing out landmarks. I cannot fucking wait. And then after you, once you get beyond that, then it's just points on the yeah, map. Yeah, it's and, a map market. Which you can me. turn that shit off for the most part, but yeah. there's no strong substitute for it. Yeah. You're going in blind without it. And, well, and yeah, because a lot of the game sort of requires you to use the map. Uh, it, I don't think it does, because you can complete the main objectives by just wandering the map long enough, you know? Sure. You, you sort of, like, once you get near Th any there major isn't, There village, isn't enough that supports a game without a map. Yes. They didn't design the game without a map in mind. Exactly. Even though... But that's my point. Is, yeah. is The way that Breath of the Wild does it is fine. If you want to put a fucking map in your game, do it. Yeah, I'm just saying. Like, I think there's a more doing doing that devalues that other thing, right? Like, I, th I think it's the the idea that like none of them are better or worse. It's just you can't they clash. Yeah, and 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 you can't have both exactly. Yes, exactly. Um, right. and uh, I think just as a designer, try not to take systems for granted because mm -hmm. it's like I, I think we have been narratively stagnant as a industry for a very long time yeah and i think a big part of that is because games get bigger and bigger and more and more expensive and that kind of necessitates that side content be much more distilled yeah or be much more accessible and then it's just sort of not side content at that point um and the side content is where you have those kinds of personal experiences because you're like, oh shit, I found. I mean, the this. very name of side content is already like dismissing it as side unimportant. Quests. Right. You know? It's world building, Aaron. Mm. I think we kind of took a tangent off of choices and just pure narrative design, but I think it still relates somehow. I don't know what we're gonna name this episode, but yeah, I don't know. <laughs> we just this was sort of an hour of pontificating, design talk, choices, yeah. narrative. L Ludo it's, narrative it's, dissonance. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, that's honestly that's kind of part of it. Is it's hard to talk about because I feel like I don't have words for half the shit that I want to talk about. I'm sure they. So then exist. I just sort of spin my brain and my my tongue rattles off nonsense, and I'm like, I don't know. I don't even know what I'm talking about anymore because yeah. mm -hmm. I'm trying to talk about these really abstract ideas, and all I can talk about them. I can only use the like buzzword system titles mm -hmm. that they have for themselves. So I can talk about like morality meters, but it's like that's not really what it is. I want to talk about what's beneath that, and it's hard. Yeah, we need more words like ludo narrative dissonance. Mm. <laughs> I find ludo, ludo narrative dissonance fascinating. I think it just sort of became the the poster child for it's like, it, yeah, it's the word for like you're thinking too hard about games. Yeah, but that's what I like doing. Yeah. So screw you. <laughs> I'm gonna use ludo narrative dissonance. If you don't know what that is, then you should read Clint Hawking's blog about it. Because I mean, it's a really smart. easy thing to explain. Sure, it's when the story and the game don't—they give you varying uh, senses of what's important. Yep. It's, it's and, a, and and the Clint Hawking was the lead designer on Far Cry Two, and he sort of coined the term when he was writing about Bioshock. Uh, I believe the context was that the game's narrative is all about this dismantling of Randian objectivism, this idea that. You know, we should all be selfish human beings and that'll improve society is like a super distilled version. So Rapture was this foundation of like, we're all going to work for ourselves. We're not going to work for the government. We're not going to work for the church. We're, we're, we're not going to distribute wealth. We're just we're going to be ourselves and we're going to be our own people. And then you walk through and it's literally crumbling apart. The game is the game's plot is saying random objectivism doesn't work. But in the gameplay, you are an embodiment of selfish desire. You are consuming everything. You're taking every scrap of ammo and 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 taking Snickers out of the garbage. It doesn't fucking matter. Everything's for you. It's a very selfish experience. Everything's about me, 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 me. And the game never says that that's wrong. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of the Ludo narrative uh, 
uh, what what which majiggy ludo narrative dissonance dissonance it's it's like a cognitive dissonance it's like the game is telling you that objectivism is wrong but then the mechanics of the game reward you for being in this mindset but maybe that's the point Barry maybe it is <laughs> maybe the game I believe Ken Levine's a smart man maybe he knows maybe the the whole point is that it's illustrating the concept of ludo narrative dissonance and you're wrong before it was even a term yeah <laughs> it was it was talking about it. maybe I mean that's the thing that we didn't have a word for that. Until Clint Hawking was like, I got it. <laughs> you guys, this I one's invented on me. it. It's like conveyance with John Blow. Conveyance. Yeah. I think that's that? a fitting name. Yeah. I think he invented it. Yeah. I'm not sure, but I didn't want to credit to anybody just in case he didn't. But mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe he popularized the term. People, man, conveyance. The idea that the game shows you what to do. Bring it full circle. I just want more more choices in games that involve poop. At the top of the episode, we were talking about poop. Oh, where's my poop? Yeah. Right, right, right. So that's right. the to bookend it. Yeah. That's that's a good bookend. The poop, a, re a poop really end. good bookend. A poop yeah. end, if you will. Um, cool. Well, I kind of wish I was like able to plant a flag and be like, "Here's how I feel," but it's like such a weird fucking topic. Oh, well, yeah, <laughs> and, and and also it has like so many different layers. I mean, just as an example, like, you know. Obviously, I do a fucking Let's Play show where I'm playing video games on the internet for the entertainment of people, mm -hmm. and that's a completely that, that's a completely different experience than sitting alone at home trying to have a unique yeah. situation. So everyone's in doing games for a different reason. You know, there's mm -hmm. I, th I think even Jesse Shell in his book, The Art of Video Game Design, The Art of Video Games, is it fucking called? I don't know the title. It's been so long. Um, but anyway, he he talked about there's three different players. Mm -hmm. Um, and if I'm remembering correctly, there's the player that just wants to have an experience. There's the player that wants to achieve everything. And there's the player that, uh, wants to be the best. Oh, that's interesting. Um, okay. and then there, and it, it, it's a Venn diagram. Like it, then there's very yeah. varying shades and stuff and, okay. and different games activate different parts of you and your brain. But those are the three different like aspects of, mm -hmm. so when, you know, we're talking about what the best type of game is, is for some people, it's like, I don't want that. I just want to fucking... I want a roller coaster ride or whatever. Right. And and it's it's similarly to like, you know, doing a, a let's play or whatever. It's like, yeah, I'll look up a fucking walkthrough because I want to make sure I get to the end. I don't want to mm -hmm. fucking walk in circles for an hour. Maybe at home I do want to walk in circles for an hour and f try to figure it out on my own. Right. But I can't when there's fucking 300,000 people watching. Right. So um, everyone's in, in, in it for a different experience. So I, I just, I, I feel like I need to say that because... It's so much of what we talk about feels so um this is how games should be right and it's and it's like no not really <laughs> it's, it's 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 i think it's always about wanting more diverse yeah, experiences it's just a discussion because i i think it's just we we see trends that are in triple a which then in some cases trickle down to the indie scene um and sometimes they're not the best course of action for what we want mm-hmm I say we, but even you and I have differing opinions on a lot of stuff. Yeah, well, but. yeah. I mean, just just as as the ultimate example, like I hate most games that are like AAA fucking successes that people fucking love. You know, right? I'm, I'm, I don't hate all of them. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I, I shouldn't make that generalization, but there's there's plenty of or or a lot of AAA games I will play and find merit in, even if I'm like, eh, that wasn't great, but it's yeah. like that was done really fucking well. It's well. like the fucking Spider Man trailer is a perfect example. <laughs> it's like that that got announced. The what, what is we it? We were just in, groaning in, over in, the infinite. What what the fuck is the name of the company that makes it? Uh, uh, Golden Child. The fuck? What? In uh, the sunset sunset overdrive that Insomniac. Insomniac. They they yes. that fucking Spider Man game where it was just. It's fucking ten minute action. Which, like they have a really good track scene. record, so yeah. I'm, I'm opt. I but everyone was like, "Woo!" And I was like, "I, well, I don't well, know what the game is. I haven't seen it. It's, be played it's yet. Arkham with more cutscenes. Yeah, it's, it's like I press A a couple times during a cutscene where Spider Man jumps on things, but like I don't. I, yeah, I'm not excited at all. I'm cynical and, and angry yep. that this exists. <laughs> I'm mad. Frankly, <laughs> I'm really upset. Um, but there's a fucking whole giant convention of people, hundreds of thousands of people, people sitting at home on the stream going, "This looks fucking awesome." Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, clearly. Clearly, I'm not that I don't represent the fucking yeah. main demographic of, of people but in, think, in games. I think are a triumph didn't sell at all. But I think the bigger the games industry gets, the more it should be able to satisfy different types of experiences yeah, instead of getting better and better at like two or three experiences. Yeah. And there's a lot of experiences like the kind of 
old school adventure game that have just completely died because they're largely unsustainable for a large developer to make. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, the adventure game effectively died in the nineties, although some would say it committed suicide. You mean the point and click event, like Lucas? Yeah, Lucas but Sword even stuff? then, like, 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 by the time like Grim Fandango happened, they're already starting to evolve away from just pure point and click mm. and a more like abstract puzzle solving and like environmental shit. Um, so like pixel hunting was already like being done away with, and now just sort of like every game just sort of took on some adventure game ideas, and every game has now taken on some RPG game. Yeah, ideas. Like, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. all the genres have just kind of blended, which just sort of leaves us with what should be a lot of very different types of games feeling kind of samey. Mm -hmm. A lot of like open world stuff with crafting trees and yeah. upgrade systems. And it's just like, but what does this game have to say about anything yeah. besides its setting? Which it, those settings are really fucking good now. And yeah. I can have a lot of fun walking around a pretty world, but it leaves me with nothing to yeah. tumble over. What does it have to say? That it's going to make a billion dollars. And there's something to be said about, well, we, we need games to do well to fund other games, but it's just like... Oh, yeah, man. The indie scene is crazy now. Mm -hmm. So many fucking good games coming out. I yeah. can't at all... When it comes to that, man, fucking I can't at all fault... It's my same argument with like Transformers and shit. Like, I'm a huge Transformers fan. Mm -hmm. And if those movies, those fucking horrible, terrible movies didn't exist... That, all of like my favorite figures wouldn't exist. I mean, on mm -hmm. just on a small scale argument on that in that sense is like, right. Th it's a necessary situation. It's like you can. So bemoan, I'm glad that these games are so popular now. Right. You can bemoan someone for oh all, you you bought a PC but all you play is like Call of Duty on it or or something. It's like well, but they bought a PC and now they're on Steam so they're probably gonna see some other random shit on Steam and buy that. And oops, there you go. You got someone who's playing other games. It's like. Yeah. Or even just having someone playing games is good. Well, in general, <laughs> playing games is more popular, so yeah. more people are able to make the kind of games that they want. Yeah. It's more feasible to have like a team of ten people making I, a small game. I just feel game. like we, we have we have relatively loud voices and if we can yell for unpopular design decisions, then maybe someone will hear it. Mm. That's kind of how I think of it, but it's not about this is how all games should be. And back in my day I had one game every year. And I'd play that game for a thousand hours. What's your favorite shitty game? My favorite shitty game? Oh, fuck. Maybe Heavy Rain. <laughs> that's not. That's still, like, loud. Yeah, well, it's it's shitty for, for interesting reasons. Um, fuck, I don't know. Because it's like, like... It's just across the board, like, 4.0 or lower. Well, that would be, 10. like, most games I played as a kid that I'm just nostalgic for. Yeah. Well, it doesn't matter. So... Just whatever. Like, like... Oh, God. I mean, like, even, like, the Animaniacs game on the Game Boy, you know, like, all that, like, really old shit that I would just play nonstop and I was garbage at it, and they're mm -hmm. probably not good games. There were a lot of really bad platformers that I played as a kid, or, like, like, fucking some, like, Simpsons wrestling for the play PlayStation 1. Oh, my God, they got a 1... I think they got a, either a 1 or a .5 on IGN. But there you go. That was yeah. a game that I rented and had a blast with. There you go. Over a weekend. Yeah, or, or Star Wars Starfighter, was it? No, I think that's the popular one. There was like a PS2 launch title that was all original characters. Jedi Forces. It I wasn't any kind of Jedi thing. Maybe someone could find this. It was like a PS2 launch window title. So we had it shortly after PS2 came out. We had like that and like Tone X Pro Skater 2 or 3 or whatever. Um, the Bouncer. The Bouncer? The Bouncer was a PS2 launch title. Oh, I don't remember that one. But it was this game where you're like piling ships and there was like a lady and like a gross monster dude and like... They would just like fly ships and it was not good, <laughs> but boy, did I play a lot of that. Yeah. So there you go. It's Bullet Spoiled Witch. Spoiled for choice now. Bullet Witch for me. Mm. Game's fucking horrible. Is it? But what, I love it. What was it. that on? Xbox. Xbox. Which which Xbox? The original. It's a the huge. Xbox X, One? Xbox Huig. The, the yeah. One Xbox? No, the first Xbox. Not Xbox One, but the Xbox. I, was saying, I think I was saying to you that I wish that they called the, the, the Xbox One X the first Xbox. <laughs> <laughs> the first <laughs> Xbox. No, because it's... It, 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 well, two what, things. Tell me about Bullet Witch. It's horrible. It's a third-person shooter, and the controls are horrible, but it's, like, weird, and, and it, it's, like, it's a zombie game, but, like, you're a, a magical anime witch, and there's, like, this rival that you have, and everything's during the day, so it feels really strange that you're fighting all these, like, zombies and monsters. And there's, like, these giant monsters. There's, like, huge, taller-than-skyscrapers that you have to, like, shoot your magic at and shit, and then it's just... It, 
and it's all existing in real. It's not cutscene or anything, mm-hmm. um, but it's horrible. It's fucking. Te- it's a just a mess of a game. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say almost unplayable. Um, but there's just something I like about it. But my point is, on that front, is there's fucking people enjoy games for whatever reason. Yeah, <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> We're just like, talking about what we like. What do you think? What do you like? What, what are games that you like and think are weird? What is your... Here's the question to end this podcast there on. There you go. What is your favorite shitty game? Yeah. A game that everybody hates, but you like. Mm-hmm. What is that game? Can you like it in spite of its flaws, or are you liking it because of its flaws? Oh, shit. That's another... That's a little add-on. Hmm. Part two. Um, Answer in the form of a question? Yes. What? What Jeopardy is... Jeopardy rules now. What is... Tonka tank racers for what the is PS Micro Machines whatever. racers. Yeah, for the PC that you can only get on CD-ROM. What, what is... There was this fucking CD-ROM ass fucking shit that was a tour of Springfield in The Simpsons. Oh. And you could like walk around and like click on shit and they'd be like, oh, here's a little fun thing over here. Play a lot of that. Love oh, that Lego shit. Island. That's definitely a big one for me. Isn't that like praised don't people love that because it's nostalgic i tried to play with play with ross on steam train and we had to stop the series because he was getting violently ill from playing it oh well (laughs) it is not a good game (laughs) but it like inspired a lot of people physical reaction oh man to lego island and i was just having i was drowning in nostalgia i was i couldn't breathe um (laughs) Just my, my lips at the surface of nostalgia, Lego just Island. gasping for air. Oh, man. So there you go. That's that's my shit. Anyway, I think we need to kill this podcast. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Um, Let us know. Video games. Fa- Remember, answer that question. Favorite shitty game. Yeah. Bye. Love you, babies. <laughs>